<clears throat> you will find it on page 1008 in the church bible mark chapter 6 a prophet without honor <clears throat> Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's his wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon, aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went round teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Here ends the lesson. Good morning. Can you can too. <laughs> Father, we do uh, thank you for Dean and for this sermon that he's prepared for us this morning. Lord, we pray that you will bless him and bless this word, Lord, that it will be your word for us today. Lord, we pray that you'll give him wisdom to hear your voice in the midst of it and, if necessary, change what he's prepared. So, Lord, we pray for your blessing. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oops. This, this time of the academic year can often be sort of, I tend to get lots of mixed feelings. I'm a, sick, I'm a, I'm a teacher at sixth form, and you know, my students have now left. So, in some respects, I'm slightly rejoicing. Um, <laughs> but in many respects, it's actually quite a sad time, um, especially for my, for some of my students I've had, I've been teaching for about two years. And me and Lee have also been spending time leading the Christian Union. And so we spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time with my students over two years, and then they go, off they go. But that's the job of a teacher. I spend time with students that God has given me. And I, in my case, I teach them about business and economics. Or if they belong to the Christian Union, we spend some time talking about equipping them and furthering their relationship with God. And then off they go. But if I've done my job properly, that's what it's all about. Equipping them, encouraging them, helping them to be ready for the next stage of their life journey. It was quite interesting because I had um, some of my students are on Facebook and there's a, a, a next student I had, Roshni, and she just graduated. Just, it's amazing how quickly time goes. So she's just been to university, she was at Loughborough, she's got a 2-1 doing business economics and has got this really good placement at Barclays Bank. And, um, and it's kind of, those are the little things you kind of treasure as a teacher, when you bump into uh, people in town, 
or on Facebook or wherever it might be. It's about equipping them, encouraging them, helping them to be ready for the next stage of their life journey. Well, isn't that also the case with Jesus and his disciples? In Mark 6, 6 to 12, we find that Jesus uh, gathered his disciples together and he gave them instructions and, and then he sent them off to put into practice all that he had been teaching and preparing them to do. I wonder how, wonder how they felt at that time, at these 12 disciples. Were they nervous? Were they excited and impatient to get going? The 12, each with their different characters and personalities and life experiences, probably had a range of different feelings. But each one put one foot in front of the other and their adventure began. So what happened to the disciples on their adventures when Jesus sent them off? Well, verse 13 records that they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And this is a very similar account um, when Jesus sent the 72 out, which is in Luke 10, 1 to 24. Jesus appointed 72 other people, gave them also a list of instructions of what they should and shouldn't do, and sent them out in pairs. So what did it record about what happened to these 72? Well, Luke 10, 17 says, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Now, in reality, the Bible doesn't record all the experiences that the disciples and the 72 had. But it does record that they returned with joy. So clearly, they had been successful and had some amazing experiences on their adventures. This clearly included healing, praying with people in their point of need, encouraging them, perhaps encouraging people in their normal daily lives, blessing people with God's word, and blessing people with little kindnesses that they did to the various people that they met. Some of these blessings may have been quite small everyday things. Other times they may have been significant life-changing things like healing and releasing of strongholds in people's lives. Jesus sent them out and in, in ways that were both practical and loving. So how were the disabled, um, disciples, rather, how were the disciples and the 72 able to do what they did? He sent them off. How did they heal people? How did they pray people? How did they have that confidence? Well, they had spent time with Jesus, listening, watching, and learning what he had taught them. Jesus had de demonstrated and shown them what to do when he went teaching from village to village, and then he told them to do likewise, to put what he had taught them into practice. They learned by doing it themselves. Sometimes you learn from teachers up front and over in my class, but ultimately, people learn on the job. You know, teacher training totally did not equip me for teaching. I went to Greenwich, it was great. I had a great time there, living in London. But I was totally not equipped for teaching after that, after my uh, year at Greenwich University. I learned on the job. I learned by doing. Those disciples and the 72, it's a really, I don't like this phrase, but they gave it, um, they had a go. They gave it a go. They had an attitude of trying. So what about us? Do we want to be a blessing to others? 
Are you already trying out what Jesus had been teaching you for many years? And a lot of us, a lot of you have been hanging around with Jesus for a very long time. He's already been teaching and equipping you. So how do we become equipped to be sent out and, and to bless those around us? Well, the disciples and the 72 hanged around Jesus, and Jesus was physically present to them. They could touch him, they could hear him audibly, and see him with their very own eyes, what he was doing day to day. We, however, don't really have that same experience of Jesus in our own lives because we weren't born in Israel 2,000 years ago. So how do we learn from Jesus? Well, we have two things. We have the Word and the Spirit. And we don't really need anything else. Okay, the Word of God. As you know, Glyn has, uh, has started a series of preaching about the basics of uh, Christianity, starting with the significance of the Bible. Why is the Bible the Word of God, and why is it as important? And there have been lots of different sermons on the Bible over the last few months, encouraging us to spend time reading it. And I preached about this, I think that might have been my last sermon on the Good Shepherd. In essence, the Bible is how we learn about whom Jesus is and what he did. We learn how Jesus taught and equipped his disciples to do exactly the kind of things that we read about in Mark 6 and Luke 10. And indeed to do the very things that Jesus did himself. If we want to be a blessing to those around us, then we need to have the word of God inside us. And from a personal point of view, if I don't spend time in the Bible, I become extremely dry. I can't pray. I can't minister to others effectively. I certainly can't preach. And I'm not just talking about the preparation I might have done for this. I have no words inside me. I find it very difficult to bless others. In fact, if I don't spend time reading God's word, then I become selfish even more than I already am. I simply do not have the words in me. I am spiritually dry. The word of God, the Bible, is simply not like any other book on this planet. It's not like reading a novel or a history book. God's word is alive and active and transformative. And it equips us in our hearing. We have all heard the following piece of scripture to Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scripture is God-breathed, and it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the people of God, that's you and me, the people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good deed. God's word is God-breathed. This is not just any old piece of literature. It trains in righteousness. Isn't this exactly uh, what Jesus was teaching his disciples in the 72, 2,000 years ago? So that, ev so that the people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. He teaches us and he enables us to be a real blessing to those around us. Did you know that God is extremely jealous for your attention? He's for our attention as a church, but is extremely jealous for every single one of you. And sometimes, and we may be a Christian for a long time or very, a very short period, sometimes we can kind of be a little bit sleepy and we fall asleep sometimes. And sometimes God has to 
shake us up a little, to wake us up. And sometimes God uses trial and shaking to get our attention. I just wonder whether God is using this time at Christ Church to wake us up a little bit, to draw us closer to him, to take our relationship with him much more serious. He is a jealous God. God is jealous for our attention. You know, sometimes as a Christian, I've been a Christian for 18 years, and there have been times I've been really asleep and I've been far away. And God might kind of allow me to be like that for a few, for a season. And then sometimes he says, enough is enough. And then I get a little bit of a shaking. I think, oh, what's happening? I didn't know I was asleep. The practicalities. Are you reading your Bible? Are you committed to spending time reading your Bible? Do you know how to read it? Do you need some help with reading it? If you need some help and structure to help you, help you regularly spend time reading God's Word, then I have copies of the Word for Today produced by UCB. In fact, I've asked for 30 of these, and um, people in this church are all different stages in their walk, and there isn't such a thing as one size fits all when it comes to God's word. And there are some people who can just start at whatever it is, and they can read it, and they pray about it, and God speaks to them. Okay, they don't really need any kind of notes and stuff like that. Sometimes we need, we have seasons, and certainly I do, where I need a little bit of help and guidance and a little bit more structure. And there are some very good resources. Um, this one's Kurt, as I say, UCB word for the day. And I've got friends who are very old Christians, and they regularly use this. In fact, when I see them on a Friday, often they, they we talk about it. And there just tends to be um, a line of scripture, and there's a little bit of a commentary. Okay, and there may be people in this church who use uh, word for today. Um, ignore the dates. Um, I don't think it really matters. And this one's free. I mean, I've got free copies here anyway, but if you start it and finish it, you can just get in touch with them and they will give you free copies. You never have to pay for it. So for some people, that might be really helpful. And you just get into that little bit of a habit of reading it, set some time. I don't think it really matters what time of day it is. But try and get into that habit, and sometimes that structure helps. I've, in the past, used daily bread, and, and Nigel has brought quite a few of these in. Again, these are with Carol in the bookstore. And normally you have to pay for this, but we've got loads of back copies that um, Nigel's brought in. Normally there's a little bit more scripture here, and, and they tend to be a little bit more themed. I'm just trying to think the first one. This one's going to start off with Proverbs. And it gets you to pray a little bit before you read it, and then there's a commentary, and then it gets you to pray. Again, anything kind of like that is just going to get the word of God in you, and it will stop you being dry. The other thing is that Lee does, if you're kind of techno-savvy, and you have, um, I can't remember what it's called now. It's not Twitter, it's WhatsApp, WhatsApp thank you. And he um, sends something to you every day. And again, it's a bit of a kind of a commentary-ish, but with some scripture there. My mom doesn't know. I'm going to set up WhatsApp for my mom. And because she doesn't read her Bible, she's a, a non-church-going Christian. But she needs the word of God in her, so I want to kind of sneak it in to uh, get her signed up. She doesn't know this yet. <laughs> I should be praying about it as well. Um, there, so there are loads and loads of ways that we can regularly spend time with God. So very practical things that we can kind of do. There are loads of people in here who already do this. And sometimes I think we need more testimonies. 
you know, and, and some questions that I've kind of set in the home group thing, you know, what is, I can remember my previous vicar used to say, right, what's, what's God doing in your life? She used to kind of like knock me back and think, what is God doing in my life? And it's kind of allowing space for him to do that, to speak to us. It's also, tr- us, we need some help training our eyes to look for him in the everyday. And spending time in God's word, God will speak to you. If you spend time in some really good resources like this, God will speak to you. I can promise you, God is a God who speaks. And he wants to bless and encourage Let's spend some time. We'll rejoice if you're doing that already. And um, I, Does anyone want to give a testimony of how God is speaking to them through their words at the moment? It's a bit of courage. Come on, Em. came back into my life three years ago I wondered what hit me I know in part of the back of my brain he's always been there and the journey I've had which I'm not going to go into has been horrendous at times painful at times it's been quite an experience but three years ago he came into my life in a very powerful way and all I want to say to you today is to encourage that never give up on him because he is a true faithful God I pray to him every day when I get to a point when I have to say, I've had enough, Lord, you know, what are you doing? What are you doing? Then all of a sudden, this peace comes over me. I, it, it's something I experience. I don't know how anybody else experiences, but it's a peace that he's given us, and it's to be a joy. I don't know where I'd be today without him. He's given me a heart to love to forgive, to rejoice, to be happy. Not always, but when I call on his name, he does something quite powerful in my life. So I just want to encourage all of you that are sitting here today, his spirit has come on me in a big way. He gets me singing out, and I say no, only if you want it, but then he kicks me, (laughs) go. So my word to you today is, thank you. I think we all need at times to stand up and say, yeah, God is in my life and this is what he's doing and never, ever, ever give up on him because he's too, too precious. Thank you. Okay, coming back to um, the passage of 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is God-breathed. There is an interesting verse before this and that's verse 15. So this is 2 Timothy, I've lost myself now, but 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. And how from in infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Some of you folks, in fact, I suspect most of you folks are so lucky You don't know how lucky you really are. I need to change that word lucky because it's not luck, it is blessed because there's no such thing with God, luck and God. You are blessed. You are really blessed. A lot of you folks were born and raised into Christian families. From infancy, you have known the holy scriptures. You have been washed with scripture from an early age through church attendance and various youth groups that you may have attended as a child. There are a few people in this church like myself who simply did not have that experience. Some of us have needed the help of other Christians to have the courage to invite us, to invite us to things and tell us about Jesus. I would not have been here if it weren't for Nicholas Slade. 
When I was studying to be a teacher at Greenwich University, I lived in halls of residence. I was about 29 at the time and living, living with a number of trainee teachers about the same age. I also had a number of friends living around London and so I invited them over to my place to cook them a Chinese meal just before I left teacher training as a way of saying thank you for their support while I was living in London. I'm from Worcestershire, so London was a, miles, a whole kind of million miles away from my experience. During that meal, we were all sitting around a table together, having a number of separate conversations. When Nicola turned around to me and this other bloke called Andy Nichols, and asked, did we think that Jesus really existed? Did we think that Jesus really existed? Well, this question was straight out of the blue, and there was no preamble beforehand. So we weren't having a God conversation. It was just put out there. No one had ever asked me that question before. I paused, I thought about it, and said, yes, I did. I said this not knowing whether there was any actual factual evidence that Jesus actually ex lived, but said yes out of faith that he had existed. That question tipped me over the edge and stopped me in my tracks and ultimately led me to pick up a copy of the Questions of Life Alpha book written by Nicky Gumbel, which Nicola had a copy of. I became a Christian by reading that book, and I am very grateful to Nicola for asking me that question 18 years ago, and it changed my life forever. Now, when I went and asked Nicola about this afterwards, she can't even remember that conversation. But I just think it's quite kind of strange how something can be totally amazing and earth-shattering to you. It can be like, oh, right, okay. <laughs> Nicola is now, as Uriah Heep, if you like your Dickens, as in said in David Copperfield, is partaking in glory. Or you can get that also from 1 Peter 5, verse 1. She's passed away, and um, yeah, but she is partaking in glory. She is with the Lord. And I say, I am extremely fortunate, blessed. <clears throat> Clearly, God's hand was in that. She was faithful. So people like me need people in Christchurch to be sent out full of God's word within them. As Paul says in Romans 10, how, how then can they, people like Dean, myself, call on the one that they have not believed in? And how can Dean believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? So how are you feeling at the moment? <laughs> Some of you may be feeling a little bit uncomfortable about all this. Hopefully I've persuaded you of the need to spend more time in your Bibles. Perhaps some of you will try out the UCB or other resources at the uh, bookstore outside. So let's make this really easy and reduce the pressure and make it a little bit less stressful. And there are notes on this, and I know not all of you have signed up. Come and see me at the end, because there's some little bits of instructions here. I should have put it on PowerPoint, but I haven't. So let's make this really practical. I would like you to pray for five people every day. That's number one. This is a commitment. So sometime, have a, whatever your rhythm of your life is, have a time where you pray for five people. Try not to make them all your members of your family. I pray for some of my family because they're not all saved. But try and include people around you, neighbors, work colleagues, People who are, you are in regular contact with, but who aren't Christians yet. 
So I feel, you could almost pray, God, who do you want me to pray for? That would be really quite a good, good thing. What does God want? Who is he going to put on your heart? Include the following in your prayers, although this is not an exhaustive list, and there's some kind of tips here. Pray that they would be given the gift of faith. That's really they need. I pray for that for my dad now because he hasn't got that. And there's just something I was reading up on. Um, Ephesians 2, 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. So pray that God would give them the gift of faith. Pray that their hearts would be softened and their minds would be open to the gospel. Pray that they would have an encounter, whatever that means, with the Lord Jesus. Now him to sort that out. He may use you. Pray that you would have an opportunity to talk about Jesus, and that is important. God often uses us to answer our own prayers. So pray that they have the gift of faith. Their hearts and minds are softened and opened. That they'd have an encounter. Okay, let's continue to de-stress and reduce the pressure a little bit by returning to Mark chapter 6, verse 6. What does Jesus tell his disciples and the 72? He said, don't bog yourself down. But well, actually, he didn't say that. But he did say, he gave some practical and practical advice for not carrying heavy loads. God, Jesus didn't want his disciples to be anxious and worried and ugh, stressed about this. He wanted them to go as they were, relying on what Jesus had already taught them. They didn't need extra food and clothing. Like the disciples, and we know this when we just read the Gospels, and the 72, we don't have to be perfect or word perfect. He wants them to relax and rely on him. Sometimes we really beat ourselves off. Oh, if only I had said this. Or when people ask you a question, that why didn't I know the answer to that question? Sometimes you just don't know the answer. Sometimes you've just got to leave it and say, I, actually, I don't know. You've got to allow God to deal with it themselves. You know, when you've spoken to someone or they've spoken to you, the conversation doesn't kind of finish there, does it? Even if you've parted. Actually, there's often something kind of germinating in, in your mind you know, God and the Holy Spirit is speaking to that person even when you've walked away. Allow God to sort it out. You're not going to convert anyone. The Holy Spirit does that. We can be faithful, do what we can, clumsily, and allow God to do the rest. We also have the benefit of having the person of the Holy Spirit within us and in our own lives. There's a lovely phrase in Judges chapter 6, 14. Go in the strength you have. That's what God said to Gideon. Go in the strength you have. That should be liberating. You, know, you can be imperfect, you can be clumsy. Allow God to sort it out. Jesus is also saying, peace, take it, it is yours. That's what that verse 12 is about. If any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave. Relax. Relax. Allow God 
to do what he wants to do. And sometimes I've had the people who've, who've spoken to me, from I became a Christian at 29, um, people had sown into me. And I'm sure those things were germinated and did all sorts of things. But people did that in faith. And they probably can't even remember. Keep the peace with you. Don't beat yourself up, if only, if only. It was what it was. Pray about it. Give it to the Lord. Move on. (laughs) Allow the Holy Spirit to give you peace in all that he is doing in your life. Have confidence that he is with you. This is a real practical prayer. Pray for wisdom. God, I can promise you, he answers that. Try that as an experiment, okay? Next time we know saying, oh my God, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? I do this at work all the time. It's got nothing to do with Christianity. I'm thinking of trying to do my job. So how am I going to deal with this? Pray for wisdom. That is a really practical prayer. Pray that it will give you the right words. Tell you what not to say. Sometimes you just have to keep your mouth shut. Hold on to the peace that the Holy Spirit has given you. Don't leave it at the door of the other person. Keep it. Keep hold of it yourself. One of the home group questions, and even if you haven't not a member of home group, please have a go at doing this one. Have a ready answer to the question, who is Jesus to you? How is Jesus real in your life? This is your testimony. This is your personal story. I have never had anyone question my story or pull it apart. I think we're just a bit too polite in this country to do that, which is nice. But allow you, tell your story. I've had people who've been really angry in their passion of not liking God and denying him. And then they very silly, but very stupidly asked, right, Dean, why do you believe in God? I gave my story, it just shut the situation on and we moved on. And so the fire went out. People don't tend to rubbish your testimonies. So 1 Peter 3, always be ready to answer anyone who asks you to explain about the hope you have. Right, in summary, this is almost like a prayer, this summary. Um, I urge you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to open your Bibles and be equipped with the living word of God. May you know the joy of experiencing God in your own life. Be a blessing to others and have the courage to talk about Jesus. We are all privileged at Christ Church to know that we are loved and known personally by name, by the good shepherd. Let us not keep this blessing for ourselves. Pray for five people every day. And chill. May the peace of God rest upon you and bless others in the strength you have. And keep hold of the peace that the Holy Spirit has given you. Amen. We'll just say uh, one extra thing um, to, to, to add to that. Um, sometimes um, people um, find it difficult uh, to find uh, space to read the Bible. Um, sometimes you don't want to get your big Bible out uh, if you're on a train commuting to London. I know that's not.